Hi, and thank you for joining us for our undergraduate student finance presentation. We're going to be looking at the, the process for the 2020-2021 academic year here. Um, my name is David Handy. I'm Senior Student Recruitment Manager at Newman. Uh, prior to joining the institution, I was Head of Sixth Form and Head of Careers um, for you know, a quite significant amount of time. So I've got a lot of experience in supporting students and their families through the university application process. Um, if you've got any questions about this uh, presentation today, or indeed upon the whole university application process, then please do feel free to drop me an email. My email address is d.handy at newman.ac.uk. So today we're going to cover an overview of the UCAS application process. We're going to look at tuition fee loans, maintenance loans, dependents and disabled students allowances. We're going to look at how you repay that loan and we're going to look at the student finance application process as well. So in terms of the UCAS application, uh, you register with UCAS. Uh, if you're perhaps currently in studies uh, and you're in year 12, a good time to register with UCAS is perhaps during the summer months prior to starting year 13. Um, it, that You then make that application online using the UCAS. Uh, there's various sections that you'll fill out on there. It's really straightforward, but it's where you record up to five choices of university and course. Okay, um, You send that off. If you're applying for Oxbridge, veterinary, medicine or dentistry, that application has to go by the 15th of October. Otherwise, there's what we call a deadline for equal consideration with UCAS, which falls on the 15th of January. Uh, up until that point, universities will consider all the applications um, for the courses that are made. After that, they're not compelled to. Um, once you've sent that application, us as universities consider your application. We may make conditional offers, so you've got to get particular grades or certain amount of UCAS points on the UCAS tariff. Uh, it could be an unconditional offer, particularly if you've already got your level three qualifications. Um, if you've already got those, chances are you probably will be made an unconditional. Um, you may, may be made an alternative offer if perhaps you uh, don't meet, quite meet our criteria for the course you applied for, but we've got another course we think you'd be very suitable for. Sadly, in some cases, we do have to decline students. Once you've got those offers in, uh, you'll make your firm and insurance choices. So your firm choice should be the university you really want to go to uh, with entry requirements that are broadly in line with perhaps your predicted grades. Your insurance choice, again, should be a university and course that you're happy with, but with a slightly lower entry requirement. If you've got uh, no offers or you've chosen to, to withdraw from all your offers for whatever reason, from uh, February of perhaps year 13, so prior to starting in, in September, um, you can go into a system called UCAS Extra. So this is done through UCAS Track, which is the system for managing your, your replies uh, that UCAS will give you a login for. Um, let's say you're looking at psychology. You've been rejected from five places for whatever reason. You come to us at Newman through UCAS Track and ask us to consider your application. We will look at it. If we think that you're suitable for the course, um, then you'll be made a, a conditional offer. Okay, So you have to meet those, those terms, those conditions um, prior to being formally accepted. Uh, if we choose to decline you, you go back into that pool and then you go and ask, other institutions through track, you know, you'll go to another one and ask that question. Okay, So you'll get your results uh, typically in August, and at that point we'll be confirming you onto your courses. Uh, if for whatever reason you've perhaps missed the, the, the grades and the, the entry requirements to come onto the course that you've chosen, uh, there's a system called Clearing that operates at that point. Uh, it's a very competitive um, program which helps place students who haven't yet got their university and course sorted with universities that have got courses available and I would say it's a very as I say it's a very competitive marketplace um, with an awful lot of universities in there and uh, so if you don't quite get the grades you need and you get rejected from perhaps your firm and insurance choice then clearing it is a good place to be and hopefully you'll be able to find a suitable course for yourself us as universities, we're there to support you through that process. And those of you who are in schools and colleges, for instance, I know that you'll get a lot of support from your advisors there.
So thinking about student finance, we've got two main costs. We've got tuition fees and then we've got perhaps your maintenance costs. So we're going to look at tuition fee loans and we're going to look at maintenance loans as well. Now, that terminology probably won't be used further on in the process because once you've got your, your student loan and you're perhaps repaying it, it is just a student loan. Those two, two amounts would be combined together. So tuition fees are typically between £6,000 and £9,250 a year. Um, and maintenance costs cover things like your accommodation, your travel, your food, perhaps any course materials. Your tuition fee loan is repayable. The, the word loan kind of uh, gives that indicator to you. And that covers your tuition fees for that year. So typically an undergraduate course, it will be uh, £9,250 a year. Do check with your university. It will be very clear in their prospectus and on their websites as well. It's not means tested, so they're not looking at your household income, and it is available to everyone, which means that you know you don't have to pay anything up front. It's brilliant that you haven't got to have nine thousand two hundred and fifty to pay to the university prior to going. The fees are paid directly to the university by the student loan company. But I would add, it's not compulsory. Um, students and their families can pay in full or part of the tuition fee. Um, but I think the the reality, certainly when I was uh, head of sixth form, is that the vast majority of students will take out that tuition fee loan. So when we think about your maintenance loan, uh, this is repayable and it's assessed upon household income. OK, so they'll be looking perhaps at the parents that you live with, for instance, and, and their income. Um, all the criteria for this you'll find on the Student Finance England website. And indeed, you'll find all the figures that we're talking through today are on there. The absolute latest information and your application. Um, so you'll see here if you're living in the parental home while you study, um, you can qualify for up to £7,747 a year. If you're living elsewhere, so perhaps you're going to live in halls of residence and studying outside of London, you qualify for up to £9,203 a year. Whereas if you're going to go move away from the family home and study in London, we know London is a very expensive place to live, you can qualify for up to £12,010 a year. If you want to get a quick estimate of your student finance entitlement, you can go on that uh, Student Finance England website. There is a student finance calculator on there. Uh, Martin Lewis Money Saving Expert website uh, has got a lot of information uh, about uh, the student finance process. Martin Lewis is a, an advocate for students and certainly is championing um, students in relation to student finance. You'll find a lot of information on there and he's got a very detailed student finance calculator. So what you'll see here is that uh, basically the higher the household income is, the lower that the maintenance loan you'll be entitled to is. Um, I've had lots of discussions with parents over the years <coughs> about this, um, but certainly the idea from the government is that if you've got a higher household income, the idea is that you'll be uh, topping up to, towards that maximum amount. I know in reality that doesn't necessarily happen. Um, that's certainly something that uh, Martin Lewis, for instance, has been uh, discussing with the government over the last few years. You can be assessed as an independent <clears throat> if you're over 25, if you're married or divorced, if you've got children, if you've got no living parents, if you're estranged from your parents, if you're a care leaver, if you've got no means of contacting your parents or it's not safe to do so, or if you've supported yourself financially for at least the last three years. In terms of the payment process, tuition fee loans, they're paid directly to the universities, like I said earlier. And your maintenance loan and any grants, bursaries or scholarships are paid directly to you as the student. So your maintenance loan you'll get in three instalments uh, throughout the year. So the first instalment is triggered by enrolment. So typically September time, you'll get that. And the second and third instalments are automatically paid at the start of each subsequent term. So typically that will be in January and just after Easter. There are, is a dependence allowance, so money available if you've got child or adult dependents. It's means tested, so they are looking at your household income and it's full time students only. It's not repayable, so it's in the form of a grant. Okay, And there's money available, as you'll see here, for parents' learning allowances, childcare grants, and also adult dependents' grants as well. So if, if this may be something that you may want to look into. Disabled students' allowances, again, not means tested, and dependent very much on an individual's specific needs. 
It's not repayable, so it's in the form of a grant again. And you apply for this through the uh, the general student finance uh, application. Okay, there is a section on there that you can fill out. So you could apply for a specialist equipment allowance of up to £5,849. So that's for the duration of the course. So that's not per year. A non-medical helper's allowance of up to £23,258 a year. So a non-medical helper, that could be perhaps a teaching assistant or a guide to help you around the institution. A general allowance of up to £1,954 a year. Or perhaps if there's very specific disability-related travel costs, um, that is potentially something as well that the disabled student's allowance could cover. Scholarships and bursaries. Um, you know, when I was head of, uh, head of sixth form, we used to have um, some bodies in the local area that perhaps aren't based upon a student's academic achievement would give them perhaps a thousand pound for their first year at university. Now, you know, I'm sure advisors in your schools and colleges and indeed by looking online, you'll be able to find if there are anyone in the area that may be helping to support you with scholarships and bursaries. Um, I would also advise you know, do have a look on university websites as well uh, if they have any schemes running um, that you may be able to uh, to qualify for. As students, um, part-time employment is something that vast majority of students, I think, use to, to sort of top up that income. And universities are great places to work. We have student job fairs. Um, you may have summer or holiday jobs, but the universities themselves are great places to work. Well, that's on the ambassador programmes. I'm sure those of you who've been to universities will have come across the ambassadors. They tend to be the people in the brightly coloured hoodies and polos that you'll find at events, perhaps doing tours or talks. Um, but universities have got a lot of other facilities. So you think about those sports centres, reception desks, cafes, libraries, restaurants. OK, they staff them using the, you know, that student population. OK, and universities are really good places to work. Again, we would suggest don't work more than 16 hours a week um, while you're at university. Fundamentally, you're there to, to get those excellent, uh, those excellent grades and qualifications. But it's a really good way of topping up your income uh, during your time that you're studying. So what about repaying the loans? Okay, so you repay only when um, you're earning over. At the moment, the threshold is £26,575 a year, and you repay 9% of any income above that £26,575 a year. So a quick example for you, you earn 30 k It's a really good graduate salary. You repay 9% of £3,000. £425 a year, which is the difference between the 30k you earn and that threshold, which works out at £300 a year or £25 a month, which I know for a lot of you, your phone contracts probably cost more than that a month. Good news for you is you don't um, start to be considered to be making repayments until the April the 1st after you graduate. After 30 years, any outstanding balance is wiped. So it's not like a mortgage or a car loan where you keep paying until it's all paid back. After 30 years, that's wiped. It's removed at source in the same way as your national insurance or your tax would be. Now, one the crucial thing I want you to take away is here. It's very much dependent on your, your income, not how much you borrowed, but your income after you've graduated. If your income drops below that threshold, so that £26,575 a year, then your repayments stop. OK, and that's something really crucial because you know, when you think about mortgages, car loans, it doesn't matter what you're earning, you just keep repaying. Whereas in this case, if you take a career break, you know, all, all those variance in your wages, that those repayments stop. So you'll see here, basically, the more that you're, you're earning, the more you'll be paying back a month. So if you're earning 50K, you know, you'll be uh, repaying approximately £175 a month, which I'll be honest, you're probably not necessarily going to miss. Um, but uh, you know, it is obviously dependent upon your own circumstances. Interest is added um, to, to the loan. So while you're studying at university, it's uh, added at the rate of inflation plus 3%, which works out at around about 5.4%. Uh, then when you've graduated, if you're earning less than £26,575 a year, uh, interest added at the rate of inflation. If you're earning between £26,575 a year, and £47,835 a year, it's added at the rate of inflation, plus up to 3%. So it's dependent on your income. There's a sliding scale there. And if you're earning above £47,835 a year, it's at that rate of inflation, plus 3%. In terms of applications, um, typically that window opens in February. Um, and the, the deadline for 
completion of forms normally falls on around about the, the Friday prior to half term um, in May. Um, so those students who are looking to start in September 2020, uh, the deadline for them guaranteeing your student finance will be in place would have been Friday 22nd of May. Um, they will consider applications made after that point. They just can't 100% guarantee that it will be in place. So uh, do have a look at that. If you're applying for it for future years, that sort of timing, that time frame of it opening in February and having to get it done by May, that, that tends to apply uh, for every year. What I would say as well, you don't need to know 100% your, your first choice university if, if you haven't quite sorted that out. Put down what you think is your first choice union course and if that changes, um, either shortly after you've done your application or indeed through clearing, just contact Student Finance and they will sort that out for you. So to, to complete your application, um, if you've got a valid UK passport, it's really useful. Um, Student Finance England can check your identity using that, but it's not essential. Um, as I said, to have university and course details where you think you're likely to move on to. Uh, your bank account, because they need to know where to pay that, and your national insurance number. That's and they, they will need that information. Um, when you complete your application, you'll need to add in your, your parent or other sp sponsor, you know, the first people that you, that you live with, um, for them to put their details in um, and you'll, you'll create them an account on gov.uk and they will be uh, providing information including national insurance numbers, uh, household taxable income information, details of personal taxable income and details of other child dependents. Now they always look at the previous tax year. Now I know at the moment um, there's a lot of people who've got some very different circumstances owing to coronavirus and there's been a lot of variances. Now if household income drops by 15% or more during the current tax year you can contact Student Finance England to ask them to reassess your application. Okay so if you if you do fall into that uh, bracket then please do speak to Student Finance England. So any parents or sponsors watching this I'm sure you'll be asking the question what, what's earned income okay so that includes wages, salaries, tips and other taxable employee pay, any long-term disability benefits received prior to the minimum retirement age and also any net earnings from self-employment. Unearned income includes interest from savings, uh, benefits and pensions and rent from a property or room. For most applications these days, uh, the student loan company will verify income from the national insurance numbers that you've provided. Okay. Um, in some cases, they may ask for documentation to be sent over. What I found, um, certainly when I was head of sixth and head of careers, is that uh, it tended to be people who were self-employed um, who they're asking for documentation from. Um, but so I would always suggest to students give yourself as much time as possible to complete the application in case they do ask for any documentation and get that sent over as fast as you possibly can. Now, I mentioned Martin Lewis earlier, and I would really encourage you to go on his website, www.moneysavingexpert.com. Some really great student finance resources on there, some good videos that are well worth watching. Um, but something that Martin Lewis says really that the student loan isn't really a debt. In some ways, it's a bit more like a tax okay um than a loan after all it's repaid through the income tax system you only repay it if you earn over a certain amount that amount um, re repaid increases with earnings okay doesn't go on credit files debt collectors don't chase you for it bigger borrowing doesn't increase repayments remember it is dependent on what you earn not what you borrowed uh, many people will continue to repay for the majority of their working life. But in reality, it, it, it's a tax. It is more of a contributory effect, so more like a graduate contribution. And Martin Lewis has reframed it like this. So take it the word repay and put in the word contribute. And it does make a lot more, more sense. And it perhaps makes it seem a little bit more friendly. Um, so you only need to contribute if you're earning enough. So remember that threshold that I mentioned earlier, £26,575 a year. Once you graduate, your contributions are taken via the payroll. The more financially successful you are, the more you'll contribute in total. If you don't earn enough, you don't have to contribute and you only have to contribute for 30 years. That, to me, makes the whole process and the whole system feel perhaps a little bit more friendly because I know that the word debt, the word loan, they're quite emotive language. And I've come across parents that really panic about their, their sons and daughters having lots of debt. There's lots of great information on moneysavingexpert.com, um, as indeed there is on the Student Finance website as well. Well worth having a look through. Uh, Martin Lewis has got a myth buster on his website. I would encourage you to have a read of that. Uh, it really does explain the student um, loan system 
and frame it in language that you know people every day would understand. In terms of filling out your application, I've mentioned the student finance website a lot, you know, where you've got the calculator and you've got all those other things. www.gov.uk forward slash student finance. You'll be visiting that a lot over the course of the next uh, few weeks and months, I'm sure. Um, there's some other great resources out there. UCAS have got some stuff on there. Um, you could drop a like on the Student Finance England Facebook and Twitter. And the Student Room has got some really good student finance resources as well. I would encourage you to perhaps have a look at those. So some points to remember. It's important to make the right university and course choice. Okay, Do be attending those virtual applicant days, virtual open days, and engage with you know, the institutions, with the academics to ask questions. Tuition fee loans are available to all eligible students. Future repayments are linked to income, not to what is owed. Okay, really crucial to take that away. I want you to research all those financial options out there, okay, whether that's the disabled students' allowances, bursaries, scholarships, all that kind of thing. Do have a look at. Think about um, part-time employment options as well. Remember to apply on online, online and on time. Okay, there's no need to wait for that confirmed place. If that that course and university changes, you can make that switch. I want you to check all details are correct before submitting your application. And remember, crucially, to reapply every year. By the time you've done it a couple of times you know, during the course of your uh, degree programme, you'll become a master at it. By the time you get to your final year, 